So you're here, uh, you sit back. Uh, obviously, if you have questions uh, for our guests, you can put them in the chat. Barry will talk about that. Um, so while we're having the last few people come in, let me turn it over to uh, my colleagues, Barry and Adam, to introduce the event, and then we'll introduce our guests and get the discussion started. So take it away, Barry. Thanks, Jason. Uh, welcome, everybody, to what I am really happy to say is the second annual Cinemability, the Art of Inclusion event with ASU at the Sydney Poitier New American Film School. My name is Barry Bogovich. I'm the Special Events Coordinator for FilmSpark, which is, uh, we like to call it the ASU Embassy in Hollywood. We're here to help students and alumni connect to the industry, connect to one another, and find their way into this really awesome uh, entertainment industry. Uh, I'm a filmmaker myself, which is why I'm uh, here today. I'm also very passionate about representation in media. Uh, and the more I learn, the more I want to do it. And the person that has been a driving force for a lot of my learning lately has been our frontliner guest today, Jenny Gold. She's a fantastic filmmaker and the director of this Cinemability documentary, which a lot of you have seen already. Uh, we also have two other guests that I'll let Jason introduce in just a second. These people are in front of the camera and behind the camera, and I think you're going to learn a whole lot of stuff uh, from them about uh, the subject of disabilities. Uh, lastly, before we begin, I wanted to also give a quick shout out to uh, the people at FilmSpark to put this together. Uh, Hollywood Invades Tempe crew led by Gabe Chapman, uh, the other student group that has put together this event for us today. And um, one quick announcement, it's a, an, another event that's coming up on April 18th, that's a Monday evening. We're having a really special Q&A uh, for students and alumni to participate in, to learn about internships in the entertainment industry, how to find those early entry level jobs, so on and so forth. It's gonna be a really great event. Uh, so keep a lookout in your emails for that if you're a student or alum. So without any further ado, I'd like to pass the microphone, metaphorically speaking, to Jason Scott to introduce uh, our wonderful panelists. And I hope everyone has a great event. Uh, if you have any questions, by the way, just put them in the chat. And we'll, if we have time towards the end, uh, we'll definitely make sure that you have the ability to unmute your microphone and mute your camera uh, to ask your questions to the guests yourself with your your faces showing and um, like any other zoom meeting um, you know this i don't want this to feel like a webinar kind of thing that's why we chose a meeting versus a webinar uh, if you're cool with it unmute your your uh your video camera we'd love to see some faces it just uh, gives the guests a lot more to talk to rather than a bunch of black screens with names on them. So we welcome unmuted video cameras, uh, even though it's being recorded, don't worry about that. Uh, the thing that people are gonna watch is uh, usually the program feed anyway. So uh, I'd love to see your faces and uh, have a great event. Jason. Great. Thanks, Barry. Uh, and thanks to everybody at FilmSpark who's helped set this up and uh, Hollywood Invades Tempe which for those of you who don't know, is a student club that helps bring uh, guests to campus from the entertainment industry to connect with our students. Um, so uh, I'm, as Barry said, this is the second year we've done this and I'm hoping that it can be a regular event. Uh, and it's particularly appropriate for this class because we've been talking all semester about uh, the content of the films that we make, uh, particularly looking at sex and violence, but really looking at how we use human bodies to tell stories in different ways, how those stories are based on our own experiences, as well as things that we consider to be kind of universal experiences, coming of age, first times. Um, later on this semester, we'll be talking about things like war and trauma and sexual violence and things like that. Uh, but I'm really excited to uh, bring back uh, Jenny Gold, who was the director of Cinemability, a project that took many, many years to put together. She might talk a little bit about uh, how the project came together. Um, so Jenny is here. Uh, I'm also very pleased to uh, welcome Gail Williamson, who is the head of diversity at uh, a talent agency called KMR, um, which is one of the agencies that has taken it upon themselves to uh, really take on the challenge of uh, populating uh, movie screens with actors with disabilities, representing actors with disabilities. Uh, and finally, very, very pleased to welcome uh, the actor Mark Covinelli, who you might most recently recognize from the Academy Award nominated film Nightmare Alley, 
but who is a veteran of stage and screen and is also somebody who has been actively involved in issues related to representation, access, uh, and ability. So welcome very much. Thank you to all of my guests. Very happy to have you here. Um, I'd like to start out uh, with Jenny, just to, uh, you know, to sort of set up a little bit uh, and tell us a little bit about, maybe a little bit about the making of cinema ability, but even more than that, in the couple of years since the film has come out, uh, what are some some changes that you see happening in the industry right now? Uh, what are the most significant things, especially that have changed in terms of behind the scenes uh, access as well as what's going on 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 screen? Wow, I think that's like four questions. <laughs> as it is. So, <laughs> They, 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 they can choose whatever you want, but, <laughs> but certainly what's, I, I'm curious as to know what, what, what your present take is, but if you want to tell us about okay. making the mobility, please. Well, so introduce all, yourself. Yeah. I'm yeah. thrilled. Yeah. I'm thrilled to be here for the second annual um, time that we've done this. It's second annual cinema ability screening and talk back. That's awesome. Um, and I appreciate everything that you guys are doing and, and the approach that you're taking. I think that this wouldn't have happened uh, when I started making the film. People weren't even thinking about it. In corporate America, they would count, you know, diversity as color uh, and maybe gender, you know, but it didn't include everybody. And certainly even most recently when they had the Oscars so white and talk started happening, it was a couple of years ago, uh, my my years are now messed up because of the pandemic. It's like I got to add three to everything. But anyways, um, I uh, um, you know even when that happened, a lot of people in the community that Gail and Mark and I are in, which is the Hollywood community of actors and performers and you know technicians and behind the scenes, everybody uh, who may have a disability that are working in Hollywood, we're like, wait a minute, <laughs> not even now, we're not even talking about it. Um, but we are encouraged by the certain shows that have been coming out in the recent years. Simability was released in 2018. Um, currently, uh, this is kind of news, I guess, it was asked by the US State Department to represent America in the American Film Showcase which takes the film around the world. So just last week, I, I had done a screening similar to this in Prague, and I got an email uh, last week about just people, how it changed their lives and how it might, meant to them and, you know, uh, amazing stuff in countries that normally are, are still behind us, even, you know, obviously where, where we're at. So um, it, it's making an impact domestically, but I think now it's finally having a chance to go internationally, my husband's like, make a sequel. I'm like, no, it's like, you know, I should have known it took too long to make this one. Um, although Mark would like that because he could be in it, but um, I, I didn't know him at the time, but uh, Gail's in it. So I'll, I'll let you uh, go off from there. Okay, yeah, great, thanks. Um, well, let's turn it over to Gail. And Gail, can you tell us a little bit about how you came to fall into this sort of, you know, specialized area of, of talent management. Um, and I, I'm just curious as to how common it is uh, across the industry for people to do what you do. If there's many others like it who are doing it. Well, I started working in this area 30 years ago. Um, my son was 10, had Down syndrome and got a commercial with through Special Olympics through his participation in the, the programs there. They hired him for a commercial. And he had such great confidence and such a wonderful experience. I wanted to see how to help him do it again. Just a mom. I didn't have any interest in Hollywood. I really kind of disdained it growing up with it where it would, you know, you couldn't go shop in that store because they were using it to film today, you know, that kind of thing. So I wasn't a big fan of the industry. Um, but my son needed an advocate and, you know, as a mother, that's what you become. And um, I eventually found that the California Governor's Committee for Employment of People with Disabilities, along with the Employment Development Department, had a program to encourage images of people with disabilities in television and film because they felt it would overall encourage 
employment just by people seeing the images. So um, I went, great, I found, I found my place and they wouldn't take a 10, 11 year old because they were the EDD. They worked with people 18 years old and older. So I literally just asked if I could volunteer and develop a children's division and that's where I started. Um, long story, I've ended up here at KMR, Kazarian Measures Ruskin and Associates in their diversity department, uh, working with actors with disabilities specifically. Um, I've seen a great, great change over the years in, in what's happening. I've seen wonderful actors come, come to the front. And all along I was saying, there's a wave coming and we need to be ready to catch it. We've got to get trained, we got to get paddled out there and we have to be waiting for the wave. And I think the swell is here. Um, I don't think, I don't, don't think we're all, I don't think we're all having successful rides yet, but it's gotten much better. And um, I've gone from me alone sitting on somebody's couch with a laptop to four in my department and we're still overworked. Mm -hmm. So um, the industry is starting to catch on. Are there other agencies that have diversity programs that are specifically geared towards people with disabilities or is, is or is, are you, are you sort of out on an island on your own at KMR? People are starting to get the gist of it and to look into it. Um, we, we were at a loss for a great many years. Um, the first year I was here, the collectively, the actors I worked with made $50,000. Now an agency takes 10%. So I was working for this agency to bring in $5,000 in commissions the first year. But this in 2019, the actors with disabilities that worked at KMR, that KMR worked for, um, collectively, now some of them have bigger teams now, so it all doesn't go back to my department. But collectively in 2019, they made over 3 million. Wow. And how many, how many performers are you working with? Is your agency where performance disabilities or are you working with at the moment? Well, you have to understand where a regular agent would need one Asian man in his 30s. I need one Asian man in his 30s who's deaf, who's blind, who uses a wheelchair, who's a little person, who has Down syndrome, who's autistic, who I need them all. Mm -hmm. So um, we probably have about 600 in our uh, list. Yeah. We probably work daily for about 200. There are, I would say there's 200 who are, have the acting credits that we're not just submitting them on disability roles. Of we're course. saying they could be the mother, they could be the basketball coach. You know, and we're submitting them across the board like that. Great. Well, I, I, turning to hear a little bit from the actor's perspective, you know, for Mark, um, can you tell us a little bit about your journey becoming an actor um, and especially, uh, you know, who are the, the people who inspired you to, to, to make you think that you could do this despite not looking like uh, a typical actor? Right. Uh, you're, much, you're much more handsome, which is what well, I'm trying to say. Oh, sure. <laughs> you're, too, you're too kind, Jason. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I had the same ambition that... Um, you know, probably most of this industry uh, does uh, growing up that I, I wanted to, you know, tell stories and I wanted to uh, create uh, characters out of thin air and I wanted to be on stage and I wanted people to look at me and, and you know, uh, get lauded for that. But I think uh, what was different or unique in my experience was that that getting people, having people look at me having people pay attention to me happened every time I went outside my door. Uh, I'm, I'm three foot nine inches tall. There's no way to hide it. And it was an experience that I was always on the stage, no, no matter what, every time I went outside of my door. So early on, I realized this inevitability. And I think I realized that um, I, 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 my mom put me in the second grade talent show and that was the moment I discovered that, wait a minute, I can control to a certain degree what you think of me. Uh, I can't do that when I go outside in, in public life. Uh, but on stage, I have, uh, you know, based on, on script restraints or whatever, character restraints, I'm in control of when you look at me, when you laugh with me or at me, when you're scared of me, when you're attracted to me. That's in my control. And that was like such a great drug that that was it. Second, second grade, I was hooked and I was on drugs, second grade beyond. And, uh, um, you know, so then I realized that I needed to, um, if, if this was going to be my passion, this is what I had to do, that, um, you know, you were asking like who, who were my, you know, sort of 
who did I look up to, and no pun intended, uh, even though there were very few, and, and certainly Billy Barty um, uh, was, was probably the most known actor uh, who was a little person. And I, I definitely, but you know, he was even older by the time that I started paying attention. Um, and so there wasn't a lot, but you know, when I saw David Rappaport, and that oh, may, yeah. may or may not be familiar to people, but like time he was bandage. a marvelous, marvelous actor. Yeah. Yeah. And and yeah. when I saw him work, I went, okay, you you not only are interesting because you're physically different, but you're interesting as an actor. And you've got something that this je ne sais quoi thing that, you know, like you see in Dinklage now, that you yeah. go, you've got something that is so um engaging and and so powerful. And so uh, that was the first time I got really, you know, turned on by, hey, this can be, you can also, you, you aren't just cast because you fit a type, like, you know, Gail was saying that that there are those roles, but you can be, you can excel at it as well. And and so I went and went to college and I, I studied acting and got a degree. And then I went and did theater for six years in people's basements and, you know, for nine people for five bucks a week or whatever it was. Yeah. So I could get good or what I thought was good and understand the craft. And then I came out to LA, you know, somewhat later at 28 or 29 and, and, and gave it a shot. But I needed that time to go, no, I, I'm not going to come out here and just fill a costume and just be, oh, we need a dwarf. So that's one of them. Let's just bring him in. I wanted to be known for being Mark Povinelli, who happens to have dwarfism. Great. Can you, and, and I, I, I obviously we'll open it up to, to uh, Gail and Jenny in a minute, but I just, uh, our students don't get a chance to talk to actors a lot. And could you talk about as an actor, what are the things that you look for when you are going on to a set that you, that make you feel comfortable, that make you feel like you're welcome. And th this is regardless of ability or, or, or height or anything like that. What are the things that make you feel welcome on a set or in a in an audition as a performer? Because it's it's so, it's there's so much tension. There's so much like ah, oh, they can get the next they can get the next little person to replace me in a second if I don't do my job right. So what are the things that make you feel comfortable on a set? Right, it's a great question. Um, I think for me, it's uh, it's it's all about communication. It's all about um, I do better when I have a relationship with you as the director or as um, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the DP or whatever that, again, I'm, I'm a professional, I'm trained. I know what to do. I know how to hit my mark. I know what my lines are. I, I come and I show up prepared. So I expect to be treated the same way as you would treat any of the other actors, which I hope is with respect and with communication because ultimately you're gonna get the most interesting work if it's a collaboration. And I come from theater and I feel like I, you know, I've had that collaboration before and that everybody brings their own unique creativity. And so that isn't always replicated on a set because of time constraints and because of egos and because of the amount of lines you have or whatever, but it's imperative to, um, to get a good performance out of an actor, I think, to communicate with them and, and certainly an actor who comes in that that has a disability that you know don't be afraid of that like we've dealt with it our whole lives and granted this might be the first time you're dealing with it but don't be worried about it like don't pretend it doesn't exist don't pretend that you can't talk about it don't pretend you have all the answers it's okay we've dealt with everything trust me and we've had it our whole lives or many, for for a long time if you come to disability later in life but don't be don't be scared of it. I've, I, uh, there was a, there was a, a show I did that um, uh, it had six or seven L little people actors in it. And um, it was a, it was a, a really, a, a, a very well um, acclaimed show and great writing, great directors. And uh, the, there was a, like a five to 10 minute scene of these little people all conversing with each other. And it was written, not comedically, it was, it was a, a really good scene. And we shot it and we did it and it went great. And at the end, this director who's very successful, he came up to me and he said, wow, you know, that went really great. I was so all, I couldn't sleep last night. I was so worried about this scene. And I just went, why? Why were you worried? And he said, well, you know, I, I just didn't know if it, it, it would go okay if you guys would be, you know, good. And I'm like, 
you hired us. We're, yes, we're good. We're professionals. We show up, we do our lines. We're just like, like, why would you think it any different? And so when you hire us, ex give us that expectation and then give us the platform to communicate in that respect. And Jason, yeah. if you don't mind me jumping sure. in on something that he just said, Please I had do. a meeting with Glenn Mazzara, who's the showrunner, excellent writer, fabulous guy. And on the way to the meetings in Santa Monica, I, I texted him like, I'm running a little bit late. Um, I'll, I'll be there, you know, whatever. And when I got there, he, you know, the meeting was like, he was going to give me tips about, you know, how to, you know, you know, as a director in TV, you know. And when I got there, he's like, oh, my God, I would, after I got your text, I was so worried that I didn't think I made you go so far and where you're going to park and just exactly what Mark was just referring to. But I had never thought about the other guy and what they're thinking about that they're like, you know, for a director meeting that they're thinking I can't find a place to park, you know, <laughs> or that it bothers me to drive across the valley, which you do all the time. Yeah. But his point to me was he he told me how he was feeling because he was using it as a lesson for me to think about that when I'm in that meeting because my career has been all independent feature film so trying to learn more about getting a gig in a television show is a lot different and uh I just thought it was funny because Mark just kind of hit that same story yeah yeah. Well, let's let's talk a little bit, generally speaking, and, and Gail, you can weigh in in terms of how you talk to producers or filmmakers about working with people with disabilities. What are some of the main issues just in terms of accessibility, um, access, uh, you know, that, that if, if we could all establish on our sets would make for a better working environment for everybody. So what are some of those things that maybe able-bodied people don't think about that if they did, would make it easier for everybody. Um, that's funny because my mind goes to the specifics immediately. Yeah. So I don't know about what would turn into a universal de design. You know, like the curb cuts started out for wheelchairs, but now everybody expects them for their briefcase, their luggage, their strollers. You yeah. know, we found that that was a wonderful thing for the world. Um, you know, I'm I'm kind of focused on. Well, first of all, if you meet one person with a disability, you've met one person with a disability. Absolutely. Yeah. Everybody's going to need their own sets of accommodations. I mean, I have someone I just sent on a on a show that's traveling. That's that's Mark's height. They have a step stool to get up on when they get in the bed. They have a step stool in the bathroom because that's what they prefer. So I have to make sure that is delivered to their room everywhere they go. Um, I have people who are blind that I get transportation for because they don't drive and now you're going to expect them to go somewhere new and, uh, you know, I have their transportation taken care of. And then there's some that really don't need anything, you know, they just go and make it. I mean, most, most productions, especially union productions are, you know, they check your dietary uh, restrictions before you go so the meals are prepared for you. Um, I find that most people are pretty accommodating. Um, overall. So I, I, I don't know that there's something that would, you know, it'd be great if there weren't cables to trip over everywhere because you've had, you know, a person who lives here there, but I don't think we're going to get rid of those cables. It would be nice if they had more dressing rooms with lifts. I think there's two and people are always fighting over them. And whoever has the money to create more dressing rooms would make a fortune if they did it because the aging baby boomers really could use a dressing room with with uh, with a lift. I mean, Mark, do you do you find that the steps are awfully steep when you get to those trailers? When you get to a to to a yeah, it's it's also the door because they usually open out, and yeah. so you you you're so vulnerable when you walk up, just praying that somebody isn't on the other side about to knock you straight off the steps. But yeah, I mean, that sounds like a great uh, a great solution. But yeah, there's all kinds of navigations. But I mean, I'll just tack on that. Um, again, it's about communication and it's about uh, not being afraid that there will be some differences, but that we know what those differences are so we can help you with that. And we can make your life easier be with communication because we'll, ex we'll tell you what we need. And it's yeah. oftentimes a lot less than you think. Yeah. And what's interesting is that the actors they need, they need that actor for that part and they'll make the accommodations, I would hope. Um, and they won't just in the old days grab someone and shove them in a wheelchair or whatever. There's certain 
uh, disabilities that they can't easily replace with an able-bodied person. Um, as a director, however, they don't, there's no reason to hire an, a director with a disability. There is no incentive, um, which is why my professor, when I was in film school, said, are you crazy? You know how many women directors there are and you with a disability, your odds are like insane. So I had to become a producer in order to hire myself. Um, and as a producer, I know what the producers are thinking when they recently I did a, a film where I hired Toby uh, Forrest and I, I was like, okay, you know, does he need any accommodations? What, you know, you have to think about it. And in terms of money, because it always comes back to uh, your budget, you know, can you afford, you know, whatever. I, I have some good news is that I saw recently an invention of a, um, Kurt Yeager always says, um, you know, they have to make honey wagons that are accessible. I think you all know what a honey wagon is, but um, there's an invention now that somebody made, and not only for on set for film, uh, but for an event, you know, a concert, you know, you see all these little, uh, little bitty um, uh, restrooms and sometimes they're up on yeah. stairs, yeah. Yeah. you know, you're not accessible, but um, this, the, the new invention is quite expensive. So we'll see how much of an impact it, it, it makes overall. Well, it's something that Gail said. And even if, you know, when we start to think about accommodations for people who need those special needs, we start to understand that actually it benefits everybody. So that even the conversation about, oh, I've got a blind actor and they need a driver. Well, then you're thinking about how is everybody getting to and from places? Or maybe you weren't thinking about that before. You just sort of assumed uh, again, if you're an independent filmmaker or a young filmmaker, oh yeah, they'll just show up at the set. But if you're focusing on that situation for one person, then uh, you've got enough. Uh, you've got enough people coming in. Let me, uh, for those of you who don't know what a honey wagon is, it's a portable restroom of some sort. <laughs> could be a porta potty, or it could be attached to a trailer. And if you look up, um, like you know, movie trailers or dressing room trailers, you'll see what Mark and Gail are talking about. They're often several feet off the ground, four or five feet off the ground, with a very, with like a little almost like a step ladder up at these very narrow doors that, that pull out. They're on trailers that can, you know, go from place to place. So they're, uh, they're, they're not, they're not the most accessible things for able-bodied people, uh, let alone people, whether it's people with physical needs or as you said, just aging people with bad knees. Yeah. So it was interesting when, you know, a lot of times, and I know Gail and we've talked about this performers do it too. You want the gig so bad that and we're accustomed to making our own accommodations. When I first uh, came out here, I was posting uh, my first feature film and I had an opportunity to do it at Universal in uh, one of the mixing stages down in the basement underneath the Hitchcock Theater. Little bitty one, same uh, thing that American Pie mixed at. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, we went to look at it and it had a flight, of, it had like six stairs up to get to the, the landing where the mixers were sitting and you could watch your film and, and give notes. And at the time we hadn't even moved here. My husband and I were staying in a hotel and we're like, okay, what are we gonna do? We'll go to Home Depot, we'll get some wood, you know, we'll, we'll accommodate ourselves because you don't wanna put them out when they're, you know, doing something that you want them to do. And then I got a call from Universal and they said, uh, hey, we want you to come by and see the ramp that we built. And on their own, they not only built this like great ramp, but it was like shellacked and it looked great. And then, and then in the future, when I kept doing other films and mixing in bigger stages there, they would keep making my ramp. So I was like, I'm responsible. But everywhere I went after I was there, there was a ramp. And so now I'm like spoiled if, if a facility <laughs> doesn't have access. And they found out just like Universal Design that all the carts and even the snacks that they bring in on a cart everything was easier yeah. um and if if a facility doesn't have um you know access i won't work there yeah okay um before we go on too far that we've got one more guest that i want to bring on um because he's somebody who i think can speak to uh this issue of access but also uh maybe talk a little bit about representation um and dr michael scott no relation uh, but another Dr. Scott, to just confuse things, uh, is here. 
Uh, Michael, are we, I don't know, I don't know if I see you on my screen, but um, uh, could you please introduce yourself, tell, tell my students a little bit about what you do, and then I'll follow up with a specific question for you. Sure. Can you hear me okay, Jason? Yes. Hello. Hi. Good to see you. Hi. Guys. Great. Yeah, thanks for having me. I attended last year's event as well, and yeah. it was wonderful. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, Michael Scott. I'm a, I'm a medical doctor. Uh, I've been in practice for almost 30 years in the field of physical medicine and rehabilitation, and my specialty is spinal cord injury. And currently, I'm the associate medical director at Rancho Los Amigos uh, National Rehabilitation Center, which is located in Southeast uh, Los Angeles County. And we're basically a hospital for people with disabilities. So we care for uh, folks that have uh, conditions such as spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, stroke, and uh, a whole host of neurological conditions that result in paralysis, cog cognitive impairment, uh, and basically loss of function. And we, we uh, work with them to, to restore and maintain their health as well as become as independent as possible and live a, a, a full life. Um, you know, many people may not be aware, but disability is very, very common, right? There's upwards of 61 million people in the United States living with disability. Right, that's one in four adults in the United States that has some type of disability that interferes with uh, their function. And uh, you know, even in my area in healthcare, there's a lot of misperceptions um, and biases about disability. Um, for example, studies show that healthcare providers frequently underestimate the quality of life of people with disabilities. So a doctor or nurse may see someone in a wheelchair and think poor guy, you know, you can't possibly be happy. And that's just not the case. You know, it's, it's just a, a false narrative. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about a, an experience that I had. I just want to tell you a brief story of uh, sure. experience I had with my physician colleagues uh, that kind of surprised me, but also gave me a lot of insight into this. And uh, it was several years ago, I attended a, a leadership seminar. It was about 30, 30 physicians. And the uh, presenter was talking about uh, leading teams and how uh, you know individuals on teams have different points of views, values, and perspectives, and how that impacts leadership. And so she was throwing out these hypothetical cases and polling us to, to illustrate that. And one of the cases that she threw out was that of a five-year-old girl who was injured in a car accident and broke her neck, her cervical spine, and was paralyzed from the neck down and would have to be on a breathing machine, a ventilator for the rest of her life. And the question that she posed our group was, you know, how many of you think that it would have been better if she had died at the scene of the accident, if she had not survived? All right, think about that, right? Um, you know, rather than live a life of paralysis and on a breathing machine, would have been better if she had died? And I was quite surprised because out of the 30 doctors, 25 hands went up right? Better off dead. And it, it, it kind of shocked me and threw me because I thought, how, how can they quickly decide that this type of life is not a life worth living? And, you know, even uh, the, the lone pediatrician in the group said, better off dead. You know, I thought, you monster, what, what is wrong with you? But after I reflected, I realized that their experience was different than mine, right? For them, that five-year-old girl was a hypothetical. But for me, it was very real and very familiar. And I knew of that five-year-old girl. And more importantly, I now know her personally as a 55-year-old adult. You know, same situation, very similar. Paralyzed from the neck down, breathing machine. She got an MBA. She ran several businesses. You know, she became an accomplished artist using a mouth stick to create beautiful paintings. Um, you know, she learned to come off the ventilator. Uh, using neck breathing. And, you know, she's a real thrill seeker, jumping out of airplanes, skydiving. So, you know, if, if you're not familiar with this, yeah. or the possibilities, you, you just don't know what's, what's possible. And, um, you know, so that, that was really enlightening to me. So I think it's, you know, it's really important to, to, to educate people and really raise their consciousness about what disability means. And, you know, I can't think of a better way to do that and reach more people than through movies. Right? Was, I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's just... It's just and, a powerful, that, I'm sorry, go ahead, sort of my, I mean, that was sort of my follow-up question, but you sort of addressed it already. You have the experience, you know the stories, 
the yeah. people who live with disabilities, who live with disease, who live, whether it's temporary or transitional or permanent, they know that story and it's, it's, it's normal to them. So I, I just wonder if you could talk for a second about the power of storytelling, maybe as, I don't know if you show people films or you encourage people who are suddenly disabled after an accident uh, to watch certain films, but how do you think the power of movies and storytelling can help acculturate people towards this idea of living, you know, in a different way? Sure. Well, I, I think it's very powerful to see yourself on screen, right? To see your identity depicted on screen. It's, it, it validates your life experience. It has a way of enhancing your um, connectedness to humanity. And I think, you know, in people who don't have that identity, it gives them a glimpse, right? It gives them a view of, um, you know, people and lives they may not be familiar with. So I think it, it benefits everybody to, to, to see that. And, and, and it, you know, who better to tell these stories, right, authentically than people with disabilities, right? Actors, yeah. writers, producers, directors, these are the people that can tell these stories authentically and portray them, um, you know, in, in a real way. And that's what we need more of. And, uh, you know, I commend all of you that are doing work in this space. So, you know, people like Jenny Gold and, and Gail Williamson, I, you know, I appreciate what you're doing. My patients appreciate you. The world appreciates you. So I, I, I really encourage you to continue the good work. Back to you, Dave. Thank you so much. Um, and if you, if you have to run, we know, but if you want to weigh in at any point, please feel free to come back. Um, uh, Jenny, so, you know, you're a storyteller, you're a director, you're a filmmaker. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, again, just sort of talking about why representation is important and, is, and especially in this historical moment, uh, you know, again, it's, our, it's only four years ago since Cinemability came out, but I'm wondering if, for example, thinking about the pandemic, thinking about how people have a different relationship with their bodies and space um, and, you know, who might be, who around you might be immunocompromised, who around you might have a physical condition that you have to think about a different way. What's sort of the state of things right now in terms of storytelling, do you think? Well, it's interesting, the question you asked, and what what um, films do you tell your patients that are newly injured oh, to watch? True, yeah. and it's almost easier to say, what do you tell them not to watch? You know, don't watch a million dollar baby. Don't watch all these films that are, you know, you might as well kill yourself. Like, uh, what was that? Uh, Me before you, Gail, you remember the name, that movie? Um, all yeah. these examples of horrible um, uh representations from people that don't know, the people that raised their hand in the doctor's explanation. Uh, the pandemic brought up a lot of things, the quality of life of, of um, you know, who are we gonna triage first? When everyone was like, oh my God, everyone's gonna be sick and we're gonna be dying. Uh, so I was like, hmm, you're not gonna pick me first, you know, because they, you know, they're thinking I don't have a quality of life, like, damn it. Because I have a pretty good uh, life, you know. My husband and I are pretty happy, so yeah. uh, I don't, I don't want to be on the bottom of the list because I use a power wheelchair. Because unfortunately, our films haven't educated, and I'm not, I'm not like saying everybody should always, you know, watch educational films or boring, you know, whatever. In fact, I may try to make some ability with a lot of laughs because I want people to get the message. And in my narrative films you know even my crazy cockroach you know film that we're still working on um you know we have a character two characters that have disabilities that you know we don't talk about it's just part of the atmosphere part of the characters and you know roles so you see people in everyday life that are um happy or maybe attacked by cockroaches and the i know people don't know what i'm talking about but i did a film about killer cockroaches that attack a college campus. So um, anyhow, it's in post right now. But um, yeah, so that's really um, kind of why this is important. I mean, when I did Cinemability, I started because I love Hollywood. I love old Hollywood. I just love everything. And I realized that, you know, if I wasn't going to tell the story, then who would and how 
certain films had affected me growing up as a girl. I, my family would, back then, they used to show like certain movies on TV all the time uh, before streaming and all the stuff. Now they would show films like uh, An Affair to Remember with Cary Grant, like every year. And I know my family really, really loved it. And I was like, oh, well, just because now she's in a wheelchair, she doesn't want to see the guy that she loves. And, like, yeah. and then I'd watch yeah. something like, um, uh, I think it was one of the Friday the 13th, where there was a young guy and he's like, Second one. yeah, yeah, he's, 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 yeah. he's just like everybody else. He's hanging out, he's having sex like everybody else. And then he gets axed in the head like everybody else, which I loved. You know, and so you start seeing these kind of things, and I was like, "Wow!" You know, um, something else that Mark said about when he decided to become an actor, for me, it was seeing the power you had over the audience. You know, where I was like, "Ooh, as a director, I can control," you know, how these people are feeling about something, um, and telling these stories, and and also, you know, just. I think I've been directing my whole life because when you can't physically do something, you're going to get someone else to do it and do it your way. So it was like a yeah. training ground, but um, I don't know if that even answered the original. No, of course. No, it's, it's, um, and it's funny because I'm just thinking of the, the way that an able-bodied, you know, quote unquote, normal person, you know, they look at one of those stories and as storytellers, they say, oh, it's so dramatic that loss or that inability or that trauma. And so the natural instinct as a storyteller is say, yeah, that's a human emotion and I want to investigate that. But for that character or for that person, maybe it's not a loss, maybe it's a gain of something or maybe it's just a difference. You know, I, um, Michael, I've talked I, to plenty of people that got their disability later in life that say they're better people, they had a better, you know, change yeah. the course of their life but it actually made it better. Not to say that it's not a horrible loss, but people are resilient and overcome and do some amazing things. Despite, I always used to laugh when I was doing the interviews because yeah. some people would be very uh, shy because you know I'm coming to them and I'm going to do it. And they didn't want to say the wrong words, talking about how words affect what yeah. we do. And uh, somebody said they don't like to use the word handicap. And I said, mm, it doesn't really bother me. I always thought that they used to handicap horses by giving them the most weight. So that maybe it was the best horse. So I'm just the best yeah. horse. So I'm like, whatever, you know. Yeah. So. yeah. Well, and, and it's funny because uh, Michael said something, you know, about, you know, 25%, one out of four people live with a disability, one out of four adults. I remember going to a disability study seminar as a graduate student and learning about this the, the, the theoretical field of disability studies. And the woman who was running it said something right at the beginning that shocked me. She said, disability is the default state for a human being. We are all essentially disabled. We are only temporarily abled if we're lucky. And if you reset your mind to think that, oh no, this being able-bodied is not a normal state of things and that eventually I will have some kind of, I'll lose a little bit of hearing, eyesight, motion, bad knees, uh, get a new disease or something much worse, but eventually I am going to need an accommodation. I'm going to need people to understand that I relate to the world in a unique and special way. Um, Mark, I wanna to turn to you for a second because you also work with an organization called Little People of America, which kind of has, it's a, it's a very public facing organization, but it also has a connection to show business and Billy Barty and specifically issues related to representation. So can you talk a little bit about your work with them? Sure, yeah, I've been the president of Little People of America for almost five years now. Uh, I was founded in 1957 by Billy Barty, actor. And um, it's uh, it's interesting because, you know, it started with an actor and now it currently uh, is being, you know, run by, by an actor or overseen by an actor. And uh, we've had a complication, complicated relationship with, with Hollywood. We, I think, you know, uh, I don't know what the statistics are exactly, but I think uh, for a period of time, we were the most visible of the disabled community uh, to be seen on screen. That doesn't mean it was a good representation, but I think it was the one that was, hey, they're us, but they're just small. We're, 
we're, we're less scared of the person that has a, the, the amputee or the wheelchair because that, that feels like loss, but you're like just a different thing and that's fun. And uh, so we, we'd show up on film and television and the representation very, very often was not representative of my experience and people with dwarfism experience. And, and it's even just come up uh, recently with uh, Peter Dinklage calling out um, Snow White. And uh, I mean, that representation is, uh, if you go back and watch that film, because I'm actually doing consulting work for uh, Disney on that film. And if you go and watch the original, that thing is so wildly problematic for so many reasons. But uh, the, the dwarves, I mean, those characters are, they're defined by an adjective. And, and that's the entire scope of their character. And they're, um, you know, she treats them like children. She, at the end of the movie, uh, the prince who, you know, they're the ones that save her and they're the ones that protect her and care about her, but they all get pushed aside and this dude shows up and this, this who doesn't talk and he just shows up and he, he's got a square jaw, so that's good enough. And he's six feet tall. And they're saying goodbye to her as she's about to go off and live happily ever after. And he, the prince picks up like Dopey and uh, she, because she, uh, she's on the horse and uh, she kisses him on the head and then he smiles and puts him down. I'm like, man, any, you ask any little person if, the, if they like being picked up by somebody and it's like full stop, like you're getting kicked somewhere really uncomfortable if you do that. And it's, uh, it's amazing that that was like, oh, that's charming and adorable. And I, I know they're cartoon characters, but they're, they're called dwarves. I mean, that was the representation that people, yeah. I've gone out in public and had people sing hi-ho hi -ho to me. So it's it does matter what the representation is. And it, and the Mini-Me and the Oompa Loompas and the Munchkins, I mean, the most iconic one, save for now, you know, Game of Thrones, it, there's just a long list of these really, you know, um, regressive uh, imagery. Yeah. And so it's 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 nice to see a change, and the and the change needs to come by again. Like if you're going to make a story that has somebody with a disability, which I encourage you to do, because it is something we haven't all seen before. So if you want to do something that people haven't seen before, there's a whole world out there, 25% of the population that we haven't seen their stories. Get a consultant. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to make it up on your own of what you think it'd be like. Find somebody and ask them, and, yeah. and tell their story. Let me ask Could I throw question. something in on there? Please, please, please go ahead. Please go, Gio. Yeah, For yes. your filmmakers, with just what Mark was saying to kind of punch it, um, write a script and then say, which character could I open up the diversity on? Don't write it about a disability. Don't write it for a disability. Just go, okay, who could I, who could I do this with? We get this call from um, New Amsterdam all the time. We've got these three roles coming up. Who could you put in them for us? And you'll notice there's uh, a, the head resident in the ER is a little person. Um, they have a surgeon now who's deaf and they just come to us with, you know, just give us some ideas. And I think for filmmakers to just look at each script and say, where can I put the diversity? And I'm gonna have at least one, or I'm gonna have 10%, or I'm gonna have, I'm gonna do it like the real world. I'm gonna have 25%, but maybe you can only see it on 10. So I'm only gonna have 10, but make the difference, make it happen. It's the same yeah. thing the Gina Davis Institute does for women. She's yeah. like, you know, it's 50% of the population, you know, and when I was doing my film, I had a coroner in my head because of what I've seen, because of Quincy, or whatever the TV shows, I was thinking a guy. And then I was like, okay, now I, I took the script and said, now I got to look at it through the ones of, I'm a board member of Gina Davis Institute. So like, okay, let, me, let me put Gina's glasses on and look again. I'm like, well, the, the corner could be a woman, you know, and, and it's the same thing with disability. You, you don't necessarily have to find some heroic story about one person with a disability, which is often done and usually played by an able-bodied person that wins an Oscar. But besides that, um, we could also, you know, just have a really great part. I think that's what actors re really want. I mean, yeah. when I had an agent, the only time I got called was, when someone had a film that had some disability and I'm like, really? My first feature was an action movie. You know what I mean? Like yeah. yeah. Um, well, Mark, let me ask you this because it's sort of tied to this and then I want to move on. We've got a couple of questions in the queue. 
But as an actor, as a trained actor who's played all kinds of different roles, stage, screen, drama, comedy, and everything, how do you feel about when you are approached with a role that maybe it's historically accurate, but is problematic in the way that it's 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 being rendered? But I like the character you play in Nightmare Alley, which is sort of a character affiliated with the circus. You know, how do you approach playing a, a, a historically bound role, or maybe even the fantasy role, in an authentic way? Right. Um, I mean, it's you know, to be honest, it's all in the writing. It's all mm -hmm. in um, what is the authentic representation. You can't. It would be worse to me to to make a movie about a carnival set in the late 1930s. And because of political correctness, not put a little person in the movie because yeah. they, that was a major part of of the population there, and and so fear should not guide, um, uh, uh, you know, like not wanting to approach these subjects. But you have to think, like, I mean, I I was so uh, intrigued by that role of the major because, uh, sure, he was there, but that character, those people, I'm fascinated by. The historical past of people with disabilities and and in the 30s okay so they were there they lived lives i mean they had yes they were on stage doing whatever their stage performance was or or um uh but then you know all of those people that were in the freak shows you know got dressed in the morning had conversations drank coffee had sex uh you know all of the they lived completely full lives and that's the interesting part the interesting part is not what they did on stage it's what they who they were off stage and i think that movie did a nice job of giving that character uh, a, a life outside of his performance i mean there's only like five seconds of him performing and he's not even really in performing he's just yelling at the audience basically um so i think it's really important that uh that that we don't shy away from the historical truth you, you don't want to make a movie about um you know like the abolitionist movement and not have anybody be a slave because you don't want to you know you, you don't want to offend anybody it's like you, you don't need to be afraid of it but just tell the authentic true story of, of the people and give them rounded, fully rounded characters. Same with fantastical characters. Ironically, oftentimes the fantasy characters, I've, it, it, you know, things are changing, but for years, the fantasy characters I'd, I'd be, you know, up for given were much more interesting than the humans because the fantasy character is like, oh, okay, this is not a human. So I'm going to give them a bunch of human attributes and make them a well-rounded character because you already get it. He's a, he's a, elf or whatever so you get that now i'm going to make humanize him so you can relate to him and the human characters were oh well he's a doctor but that doesn't really make sense because he's little so we're just going to make it all about his size we're not going to give him any humanity we're just going to make it about his size so yes i was a doctor but i had no i had no humanity so the fantasy characters really open things up and again i don't think it's it's you need to shy away from it it's just it doesn't have to be so restrictive. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, that it has to, if it's a woodland creature, they've got to be a little person, you know? I mean, yeah. like blow you, blow the mind of what, what fantasy is, basically. Yeah, right. Um, so we have a question from, uh, from one of our students, Brian, uh, who says he talk, we've talked a lot about physical disabilities, or very visible, I think, disabilities. What about disabilities that are less visible? Um, how, and especially thinking about on the crew, whether it's people with neurodiversity issues or people with photosensitivity, autosensory issues, um, are there other ways that we can think about this idea of ability, not just being disability, but conditions that people have? Um, Gail, I don't know if you, if you, you talked about having actors with autism, for example. Um, and how you might uh, talk about uh, representation and working with people with neurodiverse issues. You know, it's interesting when it's, for instance, in our commercial department, when they want a disability in a commercial, like the Walmart ad, I'm not going to be able to get a job there for someone on the spectrum or someone with something that isn't pretty obvious, they're gonna to wanna to see a big wheelchair or a close-up of a face with Down syndrome or a missing limb if they wanna bring in that kind of diversity. But what I can do with a lot of my clients who are on the spectrum is they can go out for typical roles. They can go out 
easier for those than someone who's deaf and now they need a sign language interpreter or someone who's wheelchair and now they need to make it accessible. So um, people with mental illness, that's a tough one because we don't wanna out people. We don't want, I really don't want to take as a client anyone who can go, out, go through their daily life without showing their disability because I'm afraid it might keep them from another job. You know, it, it's, it's a, it's a, I mean, for instance, I have, uh, I don't know that Jenny even knows this, but I've been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in the last year. And I'm able to keep that to myself pretty much. You have to know me really well to tell that. You kind of won't get an idea of it. So I'm, I, you know, I don't need accommodations. I get around just fine, but I have to stay on my meds and I have to stay on my therapy so that I'm, you know, so I wouldn't go to someone like me to represent me if I wanted to be an actor because Okay, I get a little tired faster than other people, but maybe not everybody. You know, so I, I, is it fair? I don't know. But I, I, I often tell people I, I think I could hurt their careers instead of help their careers. It's, it's part of the hiding that we talked about in cinema ability. I mean, if you can, you're going to hide. And someone um, like myself or Mark who can't hide their disability will hide. I don't know about you, Mark, but if I have a cold, I'm not going to say I have a cold. I can't go. I'm going to say, oh, I'm sorry. I reschedule. I double. I'll make up something because I can't let anyone think I'm less than 110% all the time because they will assume everything they've seen in every movie, every TV show, minus a few, um, that you're less than. And that's not the case. In fact, I think that because we all have learned our some of us our entire lives to adapt and just and adjust and overcome we're probably better at uh the the challenges that come up on a film set you're constantly uh faced with something and you have to make a split uh, split second decision I'm talking about me you know as a helmer of a, of a show and you have to be able to do it but people don't expect that because they haven't been conditioned to think that you know that maybe this what seems like a a negative is a huge positive because we've learned so much over the years you're the hardest workers yeah yeah let me well, and oh I, I, in the corporate world just sorry one sec uh, sure, just, go ahead. what she said in the corporate world uh, there's been studies that workers with any sort of disability are the hardest workers they never you know, skip days or do whatever. And then for a while, um, AT&T was hiring people on the spectrum because there were certain jobs that they couldn't keep a, a person uh, without a disability hired in. But a person on the spectrum loved the repetition and yeah, like a computer yeah. thing. Absolutely. And they were yeah. like, wow, this is a great uh, fit. So you have to fit the right person for the right job. Yeah. Well, something Mark said earlier just sort of echoed with me where he said when he was a kid, uh, he realized that because of the way he looked, everybody was always looking at him. And he turned that into, well, then I'll just be an actor where that's a normal thing, which I think is brilliant. But for, for people with sort of more visible disabilities, and I, 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 I want to ask this question in a way that doesn't sound weird, but you go on a set, people see that you're working hard. People see that you've got to work a little harder or make all those adjustments. Then you become the role model. Then you become the brave person. Then you become the hero. How do you navigate that? I mean, it's a good thing to inspire people. It's a, obviously you're, you're, you're uh, representing I yourself. Fire you I what? fire someone. I fire someone right away. Fire. Just fire someone. Then, then you're not so nice. <laughs> you're like fire someone the first day. Oh, yeah. you're fired. You're out of here. <laughs> Okay. Sorry. All right. Uh, Barry, I know you had a, you said you had a question, so please feel free to jump in. Sure. Um, this is all really fantastic. I just want to thank everyone again for, for joining. Um, can't be more grateful to, for your presence. Um, I want to riff off something you guys were talking about just recently about making scripts more accessible and more diverse, which I thought was a really, really important note for any aspiring filmmaker, even a seasoned filmmaker to think about when they're writing. Yeah, and we just had, um, Barry, we just had a question where, where uh, Cammy Gregory asked, what about people without disabilities writing people for 
writing stories about people with disabilities. So it's probably in the same vein of what you're going to talk about. But go ahead. Okay. And if it's not, uh, Campbell, yeah. definitely um, uh, feel free to unmute your, your video camera afterwards and ask your question again. Um, so my question is this. So student filmmakers, aspiring filmmakers, even seasoned filmmakers, what can we be doing on our physical film sets today, much like when we're teaching students how to wrangle cables safely, you know, you're supposed to walk onto a film set and it's supposed to feel safe and it's supposed to have all these boxes that are checked off. What kind of boxes can we add to that list for student filmmakers to think about, even if they don't have someone with a disability on set, so that they're preparing for the advent of bringing someone with a disability on their sets in the future? Who is that to? That's uh, kind of to everybody, I think. But I'll think, but yeah, Jenny, you, sure. <laughs> Uh, probably as a, as a director, I would ask Jenny first, but I think everybody can weigh in if they have a thought. Yeah. Like, and this um, doesn't even mean just in production, maybe in pre-production. Like, what are the things that they can be doing as if they have a very accessible environment with people that have disabilities? Well, uh, I think that if they're conscious of the environment and what they're doing, that that'll come. It's kind of like Mark was saying earlier, if you're, you know, checking everything twice and making sure everything's kind of uh, communicating between people, then that makes sense. And as far as the writing part of the question, um, which I think is also fascinating, how can an able-bodied person write characters with disabilities authentically? And I write, uh, I just wrote about a helicopter pilot. I don't fly a helicopter. So I did a lot of research and I found someone who was a helicopter pilot and I talked to them and I asked them a lot of questions. So basically, if you're going to write a character with a disability, don't do it from any films you've seen, because chances are you've seen a bad one like uh, Me Before You or one of these other ones or uh, one of the um, the uh, Disney uh, dwarfs. And, you know, um, you don't want to do that. You want to find a, a person who you can get to know. And it's like, well, I don't know anybody who is a missing limb. Believe me, um, Gail knows everybody. So just call game or say, ah, I need to talk to somebody that knows about this disability and she will hook you up. Um, all, all of uh, the people that I know in the industry are open to talk to people about their situation and, and uh, help them along uh, with the, um, the research. There's a lot of research in anything you write that you don't happen to know. You know, they do say write what you know and I did that once and I got a student Emmy, so that works. But when you're writing what you don't know, do a lot of research uh, so that you can tell it authentically. Yeah. Um, what, who, are, who are some of the people outside of the group that we have today who are doing really good work uh, that really inspire you? Like who are, who are the people that you, and this does have, might have nothing to do with ability or disability. But who are the people that, you know, when you're struggling to, you know, make a living or to do your job or to, to change the world in the way that you are, who are the people that you look at for inspiration now? Uh, I guess I'll go first. Uh, director sure. uh, Peter Fairley is a great guy and he's been uh, a mentor. Um, ben Lewin. Uh, you know, I'm picking all directors. Glenn Mazzara, who I talked about earlier. Um, Scott Silveri, um, uh, uh, the list goes on and on and on, um, uh, people that have been, you know, just a, a lot of directors that I know, um, that have been very, uh, supportive and, and, uh, and producers, um, that have been, uh, very helpful, but, um, yeah. So what about you, Gail? Who, who? Who's, who's inspiring in the present day to you? Well, there's several casting offices that are. So we're seeing them make a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, especially, uh, Tulsi in New York has done some wonderful work. UDK here in, in LA. Uh, I could go with a bunch of individual names, but it would mean nothing to anyone. Um, <laughs> but, uh, well, it's good, but it's good to know those, that they're out there too. Yeah. They're out there. Yeah. There's a lot of advocates. Like, you know, our office is not just, just agents, we're, we're advocates, we're educators, we're teaching people. 
when someone, when a casting director puts out a, 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 a breakdown for a, for a call, a casting call, they'll often call us and ask how to write it before they even get it out. Um, so they're talking to us. And on what uh, Jenny was saying with research, I wanted to throw in, there's uh, recently there was a, a gentleman writing a film, a rewrite of a, of a Spanish film, and he needed to have a, sort of a special Olympic athlete kind of team. And for two years, this guy followed my kids' basketball team everywhere they went. And this film will be out in the fall here. You'll see it and go, oh, that's the film she was talking about. But, um, you know, it, it wasn't quick. It was, it took him time. And I think uh, there are a lot of writers that inspire me. We get scripts in here from people and I'm, you know, I'm kind of a dead end for scripts, but I read beautiful ones that, uh, you know, people want to make and they have beautiful ideas and beautiful stories and, and they come from their heart and come from their experience. And it's lovely. Mark, what about you? What's, who are the people that you're looking at and saying they're doing really good work? Well, there's certainly a, a, a lot of actors um, that are getting more and more noticed like Ali Stoker and Ryan O'Connell and, and Meredith Eaton and, and Dinklage has already gotten enough notice, but he deserves <laughs> all of it. So it's fine. Um, but, you know, I, I wanna highlight somebody that actually will, um, uh, might be relevant to your uh, community which is uh, a guy named Nick Novicki, who started uh, eight or nine years ago, the Disability Film Challenge, which is a weekend long 48 hour, now it's 58 hours or something, um, film challenge. It's, you know, the five minutes you get a couple ideas and you go run out with all your friends and shoot a movie. And the only caveat really to this one is that somebody in front of or behind the camera has to have a disability. And um, it's really been an amazing, I mean, he created it out of scratch and it's been this amazing uh, forum and, and repository for uh, creators and artists with disabilities and their allies to tell stories and, and to get an opportunity and then to be highlighted and, and rewarded. And, and um, so I'd actually encourage you, disabilityfilmchallenge.com, I think is, uh, you, you'll find it. Um, to if you want to do a weekend film challenge, it's like 50 bucks to, to apply or whatever. And, um, you know, dip your toe into this kind of um, community and without a lot of pressure and a lot of, uh, a lot of um, cost and in, 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 in resources. And um, I think you'll learn a ton. And I think you'll be now connected into this fascinating group of artists that that is a like this big family and many of them in LA, many of them in New York. And so next year or four years or whenever you're gonna venture out to to um, LA or New York or wherever, you're already gonna have like this group that suddenly you're a part of. And we have, we have a big tent. So um, it's a great way to, and I, I just think the work he's done has been so positive and so interesting and the films are getting better and better and better. That's great. I, I just, I looked it up. It's a sponsored by Easter Seals and uh, this year's competition, you can register through April 4th. Uh, it takes place through the 5th and 10th and the theme for this year is superhero. So um, for those of you film students who have the endless energy and always want to be making extra films, there you go. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate that. Um, I want to, it's so, I think the, the pandemic um, obviously, the, the, the Oscars so white discussion that eventually became about the broad discussion of inclusivity. Um, I feel like we're in this, obviously, Jenny's movie helping foster the discussion. We're definitely in sort of a, a historical moment where I think people want to have this conversation. And it sounds, Gail, like you're saying people are approaching you as opposed to you having to go to them and explain to them why this is important. So do we think that this is... Uh, the new normal in terms of understanding diversity, or is this just another kind of Hollywood fad where, you know, 30 years ago it was gay people and 40 years ago it was black people and now it's people with disabilities. Is, is this something that we think is, is going to be sustained? I well, hope are the, so. are yeah. the gay people still here? Are the black people still Absolutely. here? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hoping um, so. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's, a there's a different understanding now. I mean, our, our world yeah. is so different. In 1979, when my son was born with Down syndrome, I could walk into a restaurant with him on my hip and silence the restaurant because mm -hmm. people didn't take people with Down syndrome out in public, you know, and nobody looks twice now, you know, he's just part, yeah. of, the, part of the crowd. 
and I think as Jenny Stone points out, a lot of that is due to normalization yeah. and through storytelling over the years, through shows like Life Goes On. Life Goes On. I mean, my you whole know. life changed when yeah. that show came out. Um, yeah. People's new mothers started being told, well, your baby will grow up and be like Corky, rather than you should really think about putting your child into an institution. I mean, yeah. it flipped. People started yeah. talking to my son, who was then 10, who they'd never, you know, we'd go out to dinner and they'd say, what would he like to eat? And suddenly they were going, what would you like to eat? I mean, I felt personally this change that came over the world. Yeah. And it's certainly, I know in my lifetime, I saw that with uh, the, the HOH and deaf community. Um, seeing sign language on Sesame Street as a very young child, being around, you know, suddenly those students were part of my classroom and signing next to me as opposed to in another room on the other side of the school. Uh, and now we have, you know, uh, you know, it's it's a long time since Marley Matlin won that Oscar for Children of Lesser God, but now we have the film Coda, which has multiple hard of hearing actors in it. If you haven't seen it, everybody, it's such a beautifully acted, beautifully done film. Uh, and Troy Kotzer, who's probably going to win the uh, Oscar, grew up here in Mesa, Arizona, and has made a career. I mean, he's a lifelong person who's never, you know, always been deaf. But he's made a career out of not just playing deaf characters, but of creating sign language for the Mandalorian and things like that as well. Um, so I think we're in a really good time. And I do hope that it's, uh, you know, I would never think it's just a passing fad, but I hope that it's not replaced by something else that becomes kind of the trendy thing. Um, let me see, hold on, checking my spreadsheet, see if I have any more questions. Um, uh, how do, how do we, um, how do, as a, as a teacher who teaches old films, and I think this, I think you can all answer this because you all grew up with those older movies as the examples. Um, what's the best way for us to look at those films, uh, and not just disparage them for being kind of ignorant? Uh, what's what lessons can we draw from them in a way that just isn't about? Te I often feel it's the same with like teaching, you know, race or gender or films that have blackface in them or something that we just find so abhorrent now. What's the best way to look at those films? What's the best way to honor the work that those people with disabilities were often doing under very difficult circumstances? Well, I, I think I, it was it was kind of interesting when I was looking back at. Because there were some films like, you know, there was Miss Susan, who was a shock to me that something like that got a, a feature film written around her to star in it because she had become disabled in an accident. And you think that back then they would have discarded her quickly, but they didn't. So there's good examples, even in the old uh, uh, way of doing things. And then there's the bad examples that we should, I think, like you said, take them in context of where they were and what they were thinking. I mean, you can't, if you're telling a period piece, then you're telling a period piece, you know? Um, uh, uh, I think that it doesn't have to, the, the thing that bugs me is when they remake them the same way, uh, which I feel like it was done a lot to um, the, Hunchback in Notre Dame. And I'm not sure that that actually improved in the four or five, how many times they freaking remade it. That troubles me. But when uh, when things are remade in a positive way with a twist, like I think what Mark's going to be consulting with uh, Disney now, I wish somebody had done that with them before, you know? Yeah. Um. Well, we've, we've got just a couple minutes left here. Um, I want to leave room for any of our guests to sort of uh, offer any thoughts that they have for, again, an aspiring filmmakers. Um, uh, Brian, actually, what, what, my other uh, student, Brian, has a question. Brian, you can unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Well, not, not necessarily a question, just to thank you for this. Um, sure. to, for to everybody involved. Uh, I'm dealing with a, a disease called neurofibromatosis type two. It's uh, um, kind of not really a very no, well-known disease, but it's genetic uh, from my mother's side. And um, I was diagnosed at age 
22 when I literally just decided to become an actor. And uh, I was a, a theater major here at ASU and I graduated in 97. Um, being an athlete when I was young, the disease didn't take hold probably until I was about 22 and got diagnosed. And there was an eight inch tumor inside my spinal cord, which had probably been growing since I was born because it's genetic. Uh, it just didn't manifest till that point. Um, I had become an actor at that point and, and had some success and actually went to Hollywood in 99 and, and uh, was out there for about 15 years. In that time, I've had two laminectomies and a brain surgery. So this disease has been like a slow boiling frog for me. It, I've been able to keep it at bay and I've done my very best to hide it for 25 years, but it's getting to the point now where I can't. And um, so I need to start thinking about the next chapter in the next direction, which has brought me back to school full circle going for my second bachelor's in filmmaking at the Sydney Portier Film School. How cool is that, having Mr. Portier's name my first year here there? So I, I, all of this is just absolute awesome news to me to, to, of, of, uh, to, to see the, the way this is going in the industry and to be able to be a part of it at this juncture and to champion this disease is my goal now. Uh, I'm looking to do an independent study with Gene Gansel next semester to do my documentary film, Tumors to Tinseltown. And it's sort of after watching Cinemability, what an inspiration for mine. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so uh, I'm sure I will cross paths with all of you at some point in the future. I just want to say thank you. And, and especially thank Mr. You. Scott. Thanks, thank Brian. you, Brian. Absolutely. Also, uh, don't worry about not being able to hide it anymore because Welcome to the club. There's, uh, the water's warm. There's plenty of us. Uh, well, I've always, the, uh, I've always been the. I've always been the. You know, the fireman, the cop, the soldier, the the, the alpha male. You know, and um, so this is very emasculating for me. And I'm just. I'm going through a process and moving. Uh, into. A, yeah, but now you can you can play it. you can play those parts because you know that. Uh, the other thing, I'll just kind of speak to that real quick is that you know i grew up in an able-bodied i have two older sisters and you know i think like an able-bodied person you know so when i'm on set i think like an able-bodied producer i'm worried about the money i you know i think this has been really helpful uh to me in in my career because except for that one thing where the guy didn't i was, was worried about me getting there other than that i kind of know how they think usually and um and uh you know all your experience in your life and your when you were more able-bodied will just fill your characters when uh you know gail gets you those other roles i was gonna say you'd make, you'd make the most interesting character actor you know think of think of the, the interesting stuff you can bring to the table and I'm, I'm your lips to god's ears you know i'm on my way and Brian, you are a true actor. That's all we do is pivot. You know, we're constantly not in the right, the, the right wheelhouse for what we think we are. We're always 10 years older than the parts we think we can play. So you're just in a different phase, you know? And and like I'm I need to dye my hair again because I keep <laughs> thinking I keep thinking I can play a 35-year-old, but it's not happening. I have to pivot. Yeah, I'm still 35 in my head too. I just hit my 50th birthday. You know, it's all a journey. So, uh, uh, Mark, you still, Mark, you still look cute. I don't care what anybody says. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, well, thank you guys. Thank you. No, thank, thank you, Brian. And I, I think again, um, your age, wisdom, experience, you know, we all accumulate that at, at our own speed. Uh, and sometimes it's based on luck and privilege. Sometimes it's based on misfortune and circumstance. Um, uh, but as things change over time, we do get enriched. And it's really, I, and everybody, whether you're 19 years old in my class or 50 or older than that, um, you know, everybody feels, so, you know, that the, that story is, is something that you want to see and you want to be told, you know, you want, you want out there. So as you move through your educational experience, as you move through your creative lives, um, as, as Mark said, we're, you're always constantly pivoting. You're always constantly absorbing that experience. 
Um, so, uh, yes, uh, Brian Ritter, please uh, ask a question and then we'll wrap up right after that. So Brian Ritter, you can uh, unmute yourself if you want. Hi, um, so I, I, I asked a similar question earlier. Um, I kind of, um, I was hoping to sort of uh, ask more specifically. Um, Absolutely, I do, uh, I do a lot of, um, I do a lot of work in the background of, um, advocating for accessibility in media. Um, I work with a bunch of people who have photosensitivity, uh, things like epilepsy. Um, I work for someone who has been advocating for um, accessibility on the platform Twitch for years now, uh, suffering with lupus. I myself has, have uh, really, uh, myself a very detailed audio sensitivity, certain sounds hurt me. And I was wondering um, if there's anything that's being done um, on the perspective of crew and actors like on set um, to make sure that things like um, epilepsy and things like audio sensitivity are um, being circumvented or being um, negated overall. Gail, would you know anything about? No, I I don't know or? much. I don't know much on set. I I do know that um, that there's some programs out here that have worked a lot with people who are on the autism spectrum and have maybe some similar issues and that things that affect them. And they've been uh, learning filmmaking and and making films. And I don't know specifically what they how they address that on set. Um, you know, I know what I do with the actors I send to set, but. I, I'm not familiar with with that because I just I don't work with crew. Well, maybe that's something that um, you know, as as an industry, uh, and certainly uh, Brian, you know, for the people you're working with, you know, maybe this is an unexplored area and something that does need to be considered more. And again, what happens when we consider photosensitivity, audio sensitivity, uh, epilepsy? Um, what happens as we start to take care of those people and imagine those people working around us in any capacity, what are the other benefits? What are the other things that we're doing? Uh, maybe we're thinking more about, uh, we're thinking more about sound pollution. Maybe we're thinking more about the kind of lights that we have that we use to create our films or to create the uh, visual effects or the kinds of screens that we give to people and how the screens that we look at can create, you know, long-term health problems for everybody. So uh, my, my last question was actually looking forward to the future, where are the things that we could look at? So I think Brian has certainly pointed us in that direction. Um, so I'm sorry we don't have a better answer for you at the moment, Brian, but clearly you're, you're on the path of, of helping to find those answers. Yeah, sometimes and, you, know, you have to be, sometimes you have to be the trailblazer. You yeah, know, uh, yeah. there's no one before you, so you have to find a way that makes sense. And in this business, it's an art form. It's the great American art form, but it is also a business. So people have to find their niche and where they fit and how they can excel and contribute to not only the, the business, but the art. And sometimes you become the, the trailblazer. Like I said, everywhere I go, I seem to leave a ramp. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, you just get yeah. to do what you got to do. Great. Well, um, I want to thank my guests for uh, coming. Thank you so much. Um, I want to make this, we've made it a regular event now. So next year, about the same time, we'll probably try something similar. Uh, Gail and Mark, you're both welcome back. Um, I, it's, you know, uh, the inspiring isn't because of, isn't just because of who you are, it's because of the work that you do. It's because of the difference that you're making uh, for other people that I think is very inspiring to me. So I'm really grateful for that. For the people in my class, uh, we are going to, I'll send out an email about class next week, what you need to prepare for and things like that. So don't worry about any of that. Uh, but let's just, uh, if we can, just please thank our guests for their time and energy tonight. Thank you again to Barry and Ben and Jen and Adam Collis at FilmSpark for all the great work uh, that you've done setting this up. Um, this, you know, it'll always be something that we're always struggling to do, to be more inclusive, to be more kind, to be more sensitive, to be more caring. Um, but if we can do that through the power of storytelling and making great movies and TV, then, um, you know, that's, that's the way we're going to do it. So thank I you. Thank so much, Jason. Everybody.
yeah thank, thank you, you jason for being a great host and uh i really appreciate it and gail and mark thanks for always uh, hanging oh my out gosh, with us this is wonderful thank you tons of fun all right well, thanks so much. Uh, you can find Mark Povinelli in uh, Nightmare Alley if you haven't seen it. Uh, Jenny, Gail, anything else you want to plug before we go? <laughs> uh, Nightmare Alley with uh, Mark was amazing. Uh, it's a great film. Uh, yeah, I've got stuff coming. Go to cinema, um, goldpictures www.goldpictures.com and check out whatever we got going. I'll leave uh, you in an Easter Seals film. Go look at the Easter Seals Film Challenge and look for Honey Bunny. Um, it's so okay. cute. Yeah, it's, it's my son's. The document it was documentaries that year, and it's my son and his girlfriend. Oh, okay, great. That's good to know. All right, and it's my winning dog. awards everywhere. It's crossing the country and and things like that. You know, when our films, when good representation films, shorts or features go around the world, it makes an impact in a lot of places that aren't as uh, maybe advanced, um, like like I was mentioning earlier before we went on, that I just got a note from uh, people in Czechoslovakia that saw my film through the American Film Showcase uh, from the U.S. State Department, and and they're moved, and and they may not be as advanced right now in their openness for other types of representation, but it just takes. These little things getting out there. And every time you see somebody else, you make a difference. So be a Great. part, make a difference. Great. As you can see, my dogs are starting to get restless in the background. So apparently we thank them too. Time. So, okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll see everybody in class next week. Thanks again, Gail, Mark, Jenny, FilmSpark folks. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.